I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. A comment, an announcement, and a talk. So for a comment, I'll just speak to the nature of meditations. Different meditations um, are different. And uh, sometimes all we do is simply try to remain present. That's great. I find, frankly, in you know a weekly opportunity to come together, it's sort of helpful to grow in our awareness of different aspects of the mind and awareness of different moves we can make in the mind or ways of relating to it or engaging it. And so, you know, fairly often I'll just kind of identify a theme. I'm kind of pointing out something, a pointing out instruction to, to be aware of in the meditation and um, to potentially use that if, if it's useful, only if it's useful uh, in your meditation. Uh, the aspect of opening is uh, appreciated in Tibetan Buddhism. That's where I found it. And it's a very interesting inquiry to explore opening. And as we open inherently, we relax contraction. We're moving away from contraction. We tend to be moving away from separation, away from a pressured, beleaguered sense of ourselves. You know, we're moving out and away from identification and possessive possessiveness. And so as we do opening, very often in opening alone is a reducing of suffering and a coming out into a wider whole in its own right. And even as we observe things moment by moment appearing in awareness, they are in effect opening into awareness. And to appreciate the nature of that, to appreciate that all mental phenomena have the nature of opening. Wow, that's pretty cool. That lightens the heart and takes us into relatedness with everything. Uh, and then there's the dimension of just uh, from time to time finding whatever you can enjoy uh, in any moment, certainly in meditation. More specifically, in opening is often, uh, there are often things that you can enjoy. There's an easing, a softening, defenses and tension, relaxing. Ah. And as we enjoy things, that affects the brain and helps us increasingly rest in that way of being as, um, as something that is getting increasingly hardwired into our nervous system through the process of enjoying it. Wow, opening, enjoying. So these are things to be aware of. And if, very understandably, that just seems like a lot of work or, you know, it doesn't speak to you, it's not enjoyable, uh, definitely uh, just, you know, let it go. You can always turn off the volume on my voice and just kind of hang out in your own meditative practice here and now with everyone. So that's my comment. My announcement is to encourage you to take a look at uh, the chat, which, in which I'm going to put an announcement again for this really interesting and cool panel uh, from the Global Compassion Coalition about compassionate politics. Uh, this is tomorrow. It's free. Uh, you can register for it, and I really encourage you to check it out. We'll have Marianne Williamson, Mampella Rempelli, Havin To, and Jennifer Nadel, four people who have deep backgrounds in politics, uh, including Mampella as an historic figure from uh, South Africa, Havin To, longtime 
background uh, in the Red Cross, in relief work, and in um, helping Bhutan develop the Gross National Happiness Indicators. Uh, Jennifer Nadel, co-founder of Compassion in Politics UK, and of course, Marianne Williamson, uh, who's been a presidential candidate and is now, again, a presidential candidate here in America uh, and a longtime activist um, on the progressive side. So anyway, it'll be a very interesting panel. I really encourage you to check it out if it interests you. Um, and to do that, just hit the link and, and then you can register for it and, and you'll have access to it. Okay? All right. Now to my talk. Um, as you know, uh, probably, I have been focusing on wise effort as an overarching theme. And recently, I've been kind of crystallizing my reflections on this, uh, pulling together a lot of material from a lot of sources, and reflecting on what could be said to be four wise efforts, or the four wise efforts that certainly include a lot of other things. What are those four? Well, um, you know, there are different ways to summarize things and organize them. And a way that comes to me is uh, to make the effort of coming home. That's the first wise effort. We've, we've talked about that a bit. Come home to the present. Come home to the place where you are. Come home to your own uh, inherent good nature. Uh, let yourself come home to the resting state of the body-mind when it is no longer driven from home by craving. Come home. Second wise effort, uh, take in the good. Receive the good into yourself. Uh, grow the good that lasts inside yourself. Recognize what is good alongside what is bad, in part to help you deal with the bad more effectively. Take in the good. Um, steepen your learning curve along the way. Third wise effort is one that we'll be exploring tonight, which is let go of self. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment here. Fourth, fourth wise effort in my current formulation is love, broadly, including loving kindness and compassion for yourself. So let go of self. What in the world do we mean by that? Clearly, there are persons. I am a person. You are a person, by which I mean a body with an associated mind, and by which I mean all the information in the nervous system represented by that body, which somehow enables, still mysteriously, experiences to occur. Fine. There's a body-mind process. There's ricking, rolling along. There is georging. There is oleing. There is Gina in New Yorking. There is Susaning, Asimoing, Audreying, and on and on it goes. There are persons. Okay, so far so good. But is there actually a unified, enduring, and independent self inside? Consider what uh, the Buddha has had to say about that. And I'll put a quotation into the chat. I'll read it. And these are translations, by the way, of uh, Pali, uh, a language of early Buddhism. And translations vary, and sometimes they use kind of traditional words like lust, but you have to translate that. You could say freedom from greed, freedom from um, craving, is happiness in the world. The going beyond all sensual desires in terms of attachment to them. But the crushing out of the conceit I am, that is the highest happiness. Okay? Um, that's from Udana. And then we have, oops, let me get to it. A couple of quotations from that book, which dri is driving Jed Olson crazy. Sorry, Jed. Uh, Realizing Genji Kwan, I highly recommend it, about the pithy teachings of Dogen, great Japanese Zen master. Um, very clear. So here are a couple of quotations from Okumura. The simultaneous existence of individuality and universality in our lives is the truth of our existence. The simultaneous existence of individuality and universality 
in our lives is the truth of our existence. So we are both individual waves and the ocean altogether. That's a Buddhist perspective. You can decide what you make of it. A little later on with Okamura, a little longer practice uh, quote here. He writes, we cannot practice by ourselves. The subject of practice is not one particular person. It is all things carrying out practice and realization through the individual's body and mind. This is, quote unquote, dropping off body and mind, a Zen term. Dropping off body and mind means we participate with the whole universe as it practices through our individual bodies and minds. We don't practice individually to improve ourselves. Rather, we settle down peacefully within the network of interdependent origination and allow the universal life force to practice through us for all beings. What does that mean? <laughs> Say what? How to do it? And let's explore this in some grounded, practical ways. I'll move along fairly briskly and then really try to maintain uh, some time toward the end for questions, including perhaps with some of you individually. So my first headline, care for yourself as a person. Paradoxically, as we care for ourselves as persons, then what tends to happen is that there is less sense of being gripped by a contracted, pressured, uh, presumed self inside. Okay? Hang on. Huh. Great. So one teaching from the Buddha is very central here. If one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? Right? We need to take care of ourselves, uh, in part because then we have the capacity to take good care of others. Or, I'll just go further, taking care of yourself as a person, as the whole of yourself, means treating your own life like it matters. It doesn't matter maybe more than others, but it does not matter less than others. And that commitment that's very tender and intimate for yourself is the foundation of all practice, all coping, and really long-term all fulfillment in this life. This involves addressing your real needs. Interestingly, the sense of self, of taking things personally, of getting possessive, you know, being self-preoccupied, with which there's a lot of suffering, that tendency increases when we feel our needs are not being met. Understandably, we, unlike other primates and um, other mammals in general, we're still trying to figure out what the whales and dolphins and porpoises are up to. But in general, the, the, our human sense of self is very unusual. And it evolved because it has functional benefits. It tends to motivate intense pursuit of meeting our own needs. So if you don't feel your needs are met, selfing increases. If you want to self less, less self, address your needs as best you can, given the limitations in your life. But needs matter. Pay attention to them. Really. I see a lot of people who are very motivated to address the needs of others, but eh, they keep postponing, honoring their own deep needs. Maybe you have a deep need at this age of life to actually keep start moving your body more. Uh, you have a need for a, a really wholesome diet. You got away with some stuff like I did uh, in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. 
But now you sort of have to clean up your act. Maybe you need that. Maybe you need more expression of your passions, your creativity, uh, your uh, deeply felt political values. Address your needs. Stand up for yourself. Another aspect of caring for yourself as a person. Uh, appropriately, many people have written about this. I have in my book, Making Great Relationships. There are skillful ways to assert yourself. The Buddha talked about skillful ways to assert oneself as well. You know, stand up for yourself. That's part of caring for yourself as a person. Uh, get the resources you need. That's another thing I see. I think a lot of people are under-resourced. You know, their challenges are this big. Their resources are that big. You need to resource up. Okay? That means potentially reaching out to others, gathering information, getting a second opinion on a health concern that's been nagging at you. Uh, make friends with your neighbors. Uh, when I grew up, we knew all our neighbors really well. Uh, these days, you kind of have to go out of your way, at least I do on my street, to meet people. But we're doing that more and more. Well, get the resources you need. And if you've got real problems, a dripping faucet, uh, a kid you're worried about, um, you know, got to th rethink your finances, uh, whatever it might be, try to solve those problems. Down to earth, right? You want to self less? Care more for yourself as a person. That's my first one. Second, really practical, go wide. Opening, as we did in meditation, is a form of going wide. There are different kinds of going wide that have really useful neurological benefits because so much of our self-referential, possessive, um, taking things personally kind of stuff involves activation in the midline of the cortex. But when we go wide, we start drawing on networks on the sides of the brain, especially the right hemisphere if you're right-handed, reversed for many left-handed people, but the point is the same. Go wide. So tune into your body as a whole as you breathe, your chest as a whole, your torso as a whole, your body as a whole. Know what it's like to abide as a whole body breathing. Incredibly useful foundational skill. Uh, lift your gaze to the horizon. You'll notice neuro based on neurological changes in your brain. Um, when you lift your gaze to the horizon, you take things less personally. There's more of a sense of reality as a whole, impersonally, without privileging any particular perspective. Lift your gaze to the horizon. Take the long view, right? Uh, you know, maybe something has happened that has a certain urgency to it. Okay, but are you gonna, is it really gonna matter that much tomorrow <clears throat> or a year from now? I uh, had the experience of reading many, many years ago, a little bit of history uh, having to do with the 1300s in the Western calendar, especially in Europe, and the, the time of what's called the Reformation, the gradual emergence of Protestantism uh, there in Europe. And during that general era, and we're talking here 700 plus years ago, you would read about a person who lived in what is now modern Germany or lived in what is now modern Italy. You'd read about a person who had a remarkable life, who really made a big difference. Boy, if, if I could be that kind of person in my life today, boy, wow, I think I really hit a home run. And you know what? I and almost everybody, besides very technical historians of that time and place, don't know about that person, have never heard of him. And so you, then you think about all our preoccupations to be regarded a certain way and to be a kind of somebody. <laughs> you know, 800 years from now, if not 80 years from now, if not eight, um, it's just, it's in the rear view mirror. So in the terms of the long view, do many of the things that preoccupy us matter that much? and see the big picture. You know, the many causes and conditions leading other people to treat you as they have, the many forces in your life that have led you to, to be what you are and to do what you do. You know, when we open out and we go wide and, and recognize that larger view, 
the sense of self softens. We're still a person. We still have rights and, and wants and needs that matter, but you know, you have much more of a sense of being part of a much vaster whole. That really supports, including neurologically, less sense of self. Um, then next, let go of especially four things. All right. Let go of. And remind I'm going to remind you here as I get into the th some things here in particular. To be able to let go, we've got to care for ourselves as persons and go wide. All right. So my third suggestion. Let go of righteousness. Oh my gosh. Let go of having to be right, getting attached to your views, proving your point, making sure they know that they were wrong, making sure they know that you were actually right. Wow. So much trouble comes from righteousness. And again, to repeat, Take care of yourself as a person. In other words, see what you see clearly with discernment. As appropriate, assert what you recognize as reality. Assert your values, why you care about something. Assert, um, if it's appropriate, the gap between an important value and what that other person actually did. Okay, But that all does not require righteousness top spin, getting identified with it, getting revved up around it, you know, pounding that point home. Righteousness. Like all of it, as much as you can. Not a, this is an ongoing practice, but I'm naming it. If I were listening to me right now, especially if I, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago or 30 years ago were listening, listening to me right now, I'd be squirming. Like, oh man, He's got my number. Whoa. So, you know, take a look inside. Righteousness is incredibly common. You know, no praise, no blame, but just the facts. If there's righteousness, can you let go of it? Now, related to righteousness, close cousin is resentment. Or as AA puts it, Alcoholics Anonymous, taking poison and waiting for others to die. Resentment is essentially, they wounded me and I'm angry and I'm going to punish them. Resentment, I resent them. Um, the Buddha described, by extension, resentment as throwing hot coals with uh, bare hands. Both people get burnt. So think about resentment. Often to heal resentment, it's important to assert oneself appropriately. Sometimes what's appropriate is just to let go of the grievance. Yeah, you will still think what you think about what they did, but you refuse to let it invade your mind. You refuse to let it disturb your sleep. Resentment is saturated with self because it's always about what they did to me. How dare they? I can't believe they did that to me. All right? It's very self-referential. Sometimes resentment has to do with envy and comparing, me compared to them. All right? especially if you think they cheated to get their higher position or didn't really earn it. Again, comparison. Lots of suffering there. Another thing to let go of is reproach. This is a cool word. Reproach is they wounded me and I'm hurt. And often it's not so much that I want to punish them, although I'm going to protest a bit, but I want them to move back into being loving and caregiving toward me. I'm reproachful, or I want them to be nice to me. Right? Well, reproach has a kind of wounded bird melancholy quality to it, but here too, embedded in the reproach, which can become the background of a marriage, resentments and reproach woven into the wallpaper of a marriage or a long-term relationship, Ugh, it's feeling hurt, you know, wounded, and really not repairing or repairing the impact on you inside and just being kind of stuck with it. I'm not trying to minimize what they did. Remember, first thing is to, is to 
be caring toward yourself as a person, right? Take care of yourself as a person. Really, really important, okay? But getting stuck in, preoccupied with, ruminating about that sense of reproach or resentment, that's not good for you. All right? And then, if you're really ready for the major leagues here, okay? You can explore letting go of the ongoing process of constructing the self, the ongoing process of adding the sense of self to what is already occurring in the mind. And you may be aware of this classic interaction between the Buddha and uh, an advanced practitioner of his time named Bahia, who sought the Buddha out and asked for his teachings. And the third time Bahia asked for them, the Buddha finally said, okay. And for me, it's like, my, it's like Robert De Niro is the Buddha. You want my teachings? Here you go, kid. Or Jack Nicholson, somebody like that, you know, wham. All right, here we go. Then, Bahia, I'd like to see Oprah Winfrey as the Buddha. Like, wouldn't that be right on, you know, including delivering some of these hardcore teachings? I, I want to see that movie. Okay. Then, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In reference to the scene, there will be only the scene. We're not adding a lot of opinions about the scene. In reference to the herd, only the herd. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In reference to, to the cognized or the thought, only the thoughts. This is how you should train yourself. Then, when, for you, there will be only the scene in the scene, only the herd in the herd, only the sensed in the sensed, only the thought in the thought, then, Bahia, there is no you there no sense of self. It's not added. If we're not adding it, it's not existing. Wow. When there's no self in what you're experiencing, when there's no you in that, there's no self in it. When we don't add it, there's no self present. And when there's no self present, when there's no you there, the person is, I'll say it differently, when there is no you there, when there is no self there, self is neither here nor yonder nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of all suffering. There may still be pain, there may still be pleasure, but the ongoing construction of a contracted, possessive, um, self-referencing self is not there anymore. That's a very deep kind of letting go. That's an ongoing process, but I wanted to name it for sure, okay? So quick recap. I've talked about what you can do about this really important thing, letting go of self. Care for yourself as a person, go wide, let go of righteousness, resentment, reproach, and as you get more and more sophisticated with this, the ongoing process of adding self to what's already occurring, all right? Then adding further, Recognize emptiness. This can get a little technical. I'll do it kind of quickly here. It means simply recognizing the inherent impermanence in all phenomena and the ways in which everything occurs in relationship to everything else. So nothing inherently exists on its own. I'm gonna offer two quotations here. First, from John Muir, ooh, and then second, from Kalu Rinpoche. John Muir, the great naturalist and environmentalist and intrepid explorer, 
of uh, the Sierra Nevada. He writes, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And then we have Kalu Rinpoche. You live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality, though, but you do not know this. When you do understand this, you will see that you are nothing as an individual. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. <laughs> Drop the mic. Wow. So here's another quote from John Muir about the facts, the nature of things. So there's a place, in other words, for insight, for seeing simply what's true, not adopting it as a new belief system, oh, we're all one, but recognizing, whoa, we are one. Or as Okumura put it, building on Dogen, the universality of our existence. So here's John Muir again. The, sh the sun shines not on us, but in us. The rivers flow not past, but through us. Thrilling, tingling, vibrating every fiber and cell of the substance of our bodies, making them glide and sing. The trees wave and the flowers bloom in our bodies, as well as our souls, and every bird song, wind song, and tremendous storm song of the rocks in the heart of the mountains is our song. Our very own and sings our love. Hmm. So this is a fourth thing you can do to let go of self. We're exploring how to do it. And one of the big hows, really underlined by the Buddha, is insight. It's recognizing what's called emptiness, which simply means that things exist emptily. Things exist as processes in relationship with each other, not as static bricks here, there, and everywhere, including the brick-like self inside. And we can deepen in that insight, you know, as practice goes on. Um, I want to speak to a question here. Again, I make the point that I started with the foundation of all this is caring for yourself as a person. I'm using the word self there as person. And somebody asked, don't we need to create self narratives that move us into action in the world? Um, we do need to have discernments that relate this particular body mind to your environment and to other people, absolutely. But that does not need inherently to refer to some presumed entity inside that is somehow special and particular amidst everything else flowing along in the mind stream. And I don't want to, you, it's easy to get caught up in conceptualizing around this. My advice is to just check out the possibility of first and foremost, taking really good care of yourself as a person and sustaining that ongoing not depersonalization, not dissociation, grounded sense of being an embodied body, an embodied ongoing being who's interacting with the world. No problem there. Right? There's no problem in the, in the seeing. There's no problem in the hearing. Uh, the problem is when we attach self to it. Actually, the, when the self, sense of self arises in awareness, it's not necessarily a problem. The problem becomes when we privilege it, when we identify with that sense of self and make it special and then get all caught up around it. That's where the problem begins. Okay? So then the last one, right? Number five, enjoy being everything. There's something very beautiful about just opening out and enjoy it, right? Uh, like, oh, how good does it feel to be opened out 
less contracted, you know, uh, more immersed in allness. Wow, how does that feel? So we have the beautiful teaching here from Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I think I'll simply leave it in the chat at this point for your final reflections. Um, you know, he he talks about um, just the truth of things that we can gradually recognize and you know open out into. Um, I've had a couple occasions. I'll just share um, one occasion was at a uh, summer research institute of the Mind and Life Institute. And it was a week of practice, essentially, with some cool talks mixed in. And I was doing, uh, on the day of practice, those the, the main focal day of practice, I was kind of taking the body for a walk. And I realized that the mind stream is so complicated and so dynamic and so many things are happening in it that no there could not possibly be a central conductor, a central screenwriter and director of the movie. It was just impossible. And I started laughing and laughing. That's usually what happens when people, you know, release from the contraction of selfing. It's a relief. You, as person, are still there. You're still walking. You're still talking. You, know, you still need to go to the bathroom. You're still interested in getting an ice cream cone after lunch. It's there, but but then but this I don't know this sense of a a big boss inside or an entity inside running the show just releases and you start laughing. It's like wow. I had a a, a farther reaching experience in the desert a couple of years ago, where you know kind of summarizing a lot about it. I, I just realized that intrinsically everything everything. Uh, every cloud, every star, every grain of sand, every thought, everything was simply an expression of the of, rea of the universe altogether, much as every wave in the Pacific Ocean or the ocean anywhere in the world or the one ocean really that girdles the earth, every single wave is simply an expression of the ocean as a whole and really the planet as a whole and the solar system and the galaxy and the universe as a whole I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. It's like Kala Rinpoche. I mean, I got, I was nothing like, uh, like super special Rick. Forget it. <laughs> Blown up. Like, why would that freak, why would that not freak somebody out? But I think when it comes this way, rather than in ways that are problematic, like depersonalization and dissociation, people, it's routinely, they just feel so at peace, so released from the struggle. Self, selfing is struggling. Less selfing is less struggling. No selfing is no struggling. There, there may well still be activity, there may well be pain, there may well be needs to meet, but in a certain sense of the word, like I just said, no selfing is no struggling. Okay. So, any questions? Let me take a look at the chat. This is a topic that tends to rev up a lot of stuff. My advice a lot is to go directly into your experience, deeper than conceptualizing, you, you know, deeper than yes, but what about, deeper than all that. Just observe directly, huh? What's true right now in experiencing? And what you'll observe in your experience is a lot is happening in awareness. Thoughts, feelings, sounds, sights, fine, unfolding. It's occurring. It doesn't need anyone to make it happen. It's just happening. The body is just happening. Personing is just occurring, supported by all kinds of causes and conditions. It's unfolding. And try to observe the coming and going of the sense of self, what fosters it, what releases it. And in that, you start to realize that the apparent self is transient, it's impermanent. And implicit in it 
is a reference to a complete entity somewhere inside who never appears on stage as the complete package of the purported self. Wow. You start observing that increasingly. And you start relaxing possessiveness, relaxing righteousness, relaxing taking things so personally, relaxing resentment, relaxing reproach. And as that happens, you notice that you're still going, you're still doing fine, you as a person. In fact, you're doing better than ever. That's how to do this. Bring it down to earth in your body, in your experience, here and now. And notice that a lot of the time you can simply rest in being with very little sense of self. Okay, questions, comments. Great, great, great. Great question, Liz asks, can we make ethical decisions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Andy Olinsky, great teacher, professor, Buddhist studies, he commented that, and he made the point that the executive functions of you know, the human mind still persist without needing to presume that there's a self. In other words, decisions can be made, values can be recognized, ethical decisions, therefore, uh, there could well be a kind of a transient sense or, or transient uh, sense of a reference to a familiar body sensation in the person's body and, you know, a familiar perspective, you know, perspectives arise, you know, what you know, a sense of self can arise, but if you look closely at it, you'll realize, oh, this sense of self is first impermanent, second, it's made of parts, third, those parts are impermanent and kind of dynamic and quivering themselves, and all of that is really constructed as an expression of a larger whole. Wow. And through that insight, you know, you hold the sense of self more and more lightly. Okay. I don't think I have time to um, talk to anyone individually. I like Jed's comment from Bucky Fuller also said it. I am a verb. I seem to be a verb, I think Bucky said. All right. Um, great, great, great. That's right. Letting go of guilt. Very interesting. Grace F at 725, right? So that's right. Um, People, there's a term in psychology called morbid self-preoccupation. <laughs> like a lot of clinical psych terminology, I don't know, it has a kind of weight to it. I like it, but morbid self-preoccupation. Uh, morbid, both about bad things that could happen, ultimately death, but also a, kind of a negative self-preoccupation. And one of the forms of that is just excessive guilt. Uh, we're getting stuck in remorse, we're stuck in shame stuck in regret. There's a place for that ethical valuing, right? Um, but if we keep regarding ourselves as defective, wait a minute here. First of all, people tend to not regard the person as defective. It's some kind of interior self that's defective. So yeah, absolutely. When you start realizing that you know, the person is a process and the apparent self or the sense of self inside is also processual. Repeat after me, feel the word in your mouth, processual. Yes, like a process. I like that word, it's kind of goofy. I learned it recently. So processual, yeah, and when you realize all that, you realize there's a place for appropriate passing experiences of remorse and you make room for remorse to still arise. But as the Buddha said to Bahia, I'll paraphrase, in the remorse, let there be only the remorse. In With its sensations and emotions and dynamic, turbulent, quivering, changing qualities, right? Rather than, you know, congealing it, thingifying it and getting stuck with it. Yep. Great. So let's see. Yeah, people can have experiences of release of self 
uh, through psychedelic means. Um, if you're prone to dissociation and depersonalization or depersonalization or psychotic processes, be careful with this material. Uh, I've written a lot about it. Many others have. I remember reading Ellen Watts' classic, The Book, on the taboo against knowing who you are. I read it in 1974. It annoyed me so much, I threw the book across the deck of the pool I was sitting next to while I was reading it, and it was a long deck, and the book skidded. I stared at it like an enemy, and then I walked over and picked it up and kept reading. A lot of people have written about this. The last chapter of Buddha's Brain explores the neuroscience of not-self and the psychology of it. Um, in um, uh, Neurodharma, I get into it to some extent as well in the, chapters on, in the chapter on allness. Um, so there's a lot of material you can explore here. But as I finish, as I finish, clarify your intention. Is it your intention to care for the person you are while deliberately exploring letting go of selfing in ways that seem authentic and useful for you? Is that your intention? My suggestion is to establish that as an intention, including this year, 2024. Uh, self less, love more. That's a pretty darn good intention. And then based on that intention, care for yourself as a person. Go wide, take that wide view, right? Let go of different problematic aspects of selfing, like righteousness, positionality, possessiveness, envy, resentment, comparing, reproach, and become more and more aware of that ongoing adding, of the con ongoing constructing of the sense of self or self-referencing that gets added to the stream of consciousness. That's good. Do that. Deepen your insight into emptiness. Wow. And enjoy the growing softening of the edges, the blurring of boundaries, as long as it, you don't get too scattered. Whew. Like, wow. How cool is it to be the ocean happening locally in the wave that you are? Wow. How good. All right, letting this sink in. And as I finish now, uh, I need to announce something that I should have announced from the start. Uh, I'm going to be out of town for the next two weeks. As it turns out, I'm going to London for some meetings. Um, and so I won't be here next Wednesday or the Wednesday after. Uh, next Wednesday, I believe, Sean Fargo, a longtime mindfulness teacher who I met just after he left uh, the, the uh, monastery, a Buddhist monastery, wonderful deep teacher, and who also has a lot of background in the business world and bringing mindfulness into practical settings. He'll be our guest teacher. And then the week after that, on the 24th, uh, my longtime friends, uh, Samuel Bonder and Linda Graves Bonder, will be co-teaching. They come from a deeply rooted spiritual tradition in which they'll be, you know, focusing on themes that'll be appropriate for us. Uh, Samuel um, was a teacher of mine as, uh, in, in my involvement with the Adafri John community way back in the 1980s. And he was one of the key people who, you know, uh, came through that whole process while staying sane <laughs> and grounded and not, car not carried away by the craziness of it. Anyway, Samuel's great and Linda as well. So they'll be here on the 24th. And then I will come back the uh, Wednesday after that. So be nice, keep practicing, show up, please. Be good to them. And um, I'll see you really quite soon. And meanwhile, you know, right? Selfless, love more. And think of so many troubles in the world that are so much based on intensities of selfing and grievance and righteousness and selfishness. Uh, woof, right? What a better world it would be, wouldn't it, right? If we all selfed less and loved more. <laughs>